you want horror, I'll give you horror. Look at your dividend portfolio. <laughs> Actually, it should be more like Christmas. I mean, this is a pretty exciting time to be in the markets, isn't it? Every day it seems like something new is going on. But today, I want to dive into um, some fascinating perspectives on the broader Canadian market here, folks. I want to take a look not only at each individual sector, but show you kind of the end-all, be-all investment conclusion that many of you are probably well aware of at this point that kind of resolved a lot of the problems that the Canadian market has been having. And then we're going to take a look at about five or six Canadian stocks and show you how hard it is to actually get like outsized returns out of Canadian dividend stocks, especially ones that probably aren't the most commonly discussed in the community. So I think this should be a really well-rounded conversation. And when I mean outperform, I'm talking about the S&P 500 because it ain't hard to outperform the TSX if you buy in stocks uh, that anywhere sit on the top half of the S&P 500, right? So uh, getting into this though, folks, I really want to just divulge first and foremost, sector ETFs. These sector ETFs really kind of give you that full idea of like how hard different aspects of the market have just been in full-blown calamity since this interest rate cycle has taken place. And first and foremost, probably one of the best ETFs and one of the most under-discussed ETFs, and I'll never buy these kind of ETFs and I'll explain why, but most people aren't even aware that we actually have like a technology sector. Nobody ever talks about Canadian technology outside of Shopify, but there are quite a few proponents. They're just relatively smaller cap based companies, but you take a look at the performance since like 2013, you kind of get a 10 year perspective on this. And this thing's up almost 500 percent. It hasn't rebounded as heavily as something like the QQQ has. And I think that's because the Qs or the NASDAQ 100 kind of stocks are a little bit more resilient and there's a lot more diversity within them. Whereas this, you're going to notice some pretty heavy concentration. But this is uh, the iShares S&P TSX capped information technology ETF uh, by BlackRock, which BlackRock is pretty much the primary owner of you know, every major ETF in Canada. And I'm not the biggest fan of sector ETFs for the primary reason. And I know this isn't a dividend ETF, but we got to talk about it. But the massive fees on these suckers are absolutely, you know, just bonkers at 0.6%. Like it, it honestly just kills you inside. I, I usually don't like getting anything over 0.2.3 at max, but I mean, that's just far too extreme. But you take a look at this and I always find it really intriguing. You got Constellation Software up here at almost 30%. Again, super heavily weighted in Shopify. These two ET or these two stocks alone make up what, 60% pretty much of the entire ETF, give or take, or probably closer to 50, sorry. So, I mean, these two, ET you can buy these two stocks, you pretty much have Canadians, uh, Canada's entire technology sector, right? But there's a lot of weird ones in here, like CGI, Open Text Corp. Um, you know, I haven't even really heard of these, right? Have you ever heard of Connexus? I mean, Lightspeed Commerce, there's BlackBerry. It's crazy that BlackBerry still appears on here. I mean, BlackBerry, I mean, is one of those meme stocks uh, at best, right? But it's just... It's just crazy to me because this ETF has actually absolutely crushed the market, but primarily just because Shopify and Constellation Software have been big outperformers and a couple of these other ones here like CGI. But outside of that, very interesting ETF. Don't really want to talk about it as much because, again, who cares about tech companies in Canada or so it seems. But nonetheless, let's get right into this with, um, first and foremost, the utility ETF. And this one is really breaking my heart uh, for a few reasons, because I remember when GICs just started becoming a big thing here in Canada. You know, interest rates were up. All of a sudden you had things like Bank of Nova Scotia really pumping out market backed GICs with the potential of a guaranteed like 5% return, but with way more upside because you could have it linked to the utility uh, sector. And I, I was really kind of intrigued by that aspect, but man, oh man, that cannot be working out for them right now. And I'm gonna have to do some deep diving into it to see like, does it actually hinder the performance or is there no downside risk? I didn't look too much into it, but this utility ETF is now down almost 30%. And again, this is another BlackRock beauty here. I mean, it was doing very well up till this interest rate cycle, which was definitely expected at this point. If there's one thing we can learn from a crazy environment cycle like this is that anything that is heavily, you know, indebted, which most is crazy because most consumer staples talked about it with Pepsi today, most, you know, infrastructure companies are just within these sectors, right? So it's really hard to avoid them if you love these kind of stocks and you've overweighted them in your portfolio because a lot of people just end all be all consumer stable kind of stocks. Now this thing's yielding 4%, but that 4% is largely being eaten away yet again by this 0.6. It's got a higher frigging fee on it than the, the technology ETF does at 0.61, which is just kind of, Ugh, jaw dropping at best when Fortis makes up 23% of the portfolio, Brookfield infrastructure at 15 and Amera at 11. 
just like the technology ETF, you're probably better off just picking the top three, buying those, maybe the top four, because I am a big fan of Hydro One. But when you take a look here also at the dividend returns, which is going to be a big proponent of this conversation, it blows my mind that the 10-year Geiger on this is 1.68%. I mean, there's virtually been absolutely, and this is like my parents heading into retirement. This is a big conversation I have with a lot of dividend investors. You want two aspects to your portfolio always. You need growth and you need income. If you start over drooling around high yielding stocks, you're going to give up probably the most return you're ever going to see in the future. But if you focus too much on growth, I mean, you do end up in markets like this where growth hasn't hit all time highs uh, in pretendably a good couple of years. And you don't really maybe have um, reinvestable cash flow. You might not have a lot of aspects to that in your portfolio. So you, it's kind of trying to find the balance that best fits. But it kind of blows my mind uh, that an ETF like this in the utility sector with these kind of companies has seen virtually no dividend growth. And I don't know. If that it might be because of management. Maybe it's because they've been moving stocks around high fees. I don't know what the deal is, but that seems almost unbelievable to me. But you also have the share. This, this is probably one <laughs> used to be an ETF I, I admired and I thought about buying could be at a good discount play here for when we recover from the interest rate cycle. But obviously the Vanguard FTSE Canadian capped REIT index. And we've had a lengthy discussion on one of these streams, uh, you know, stocks to buy. I can't remember what episode where somebody was asking me about this. Now, this thing also in just pure calamity mode right now. And uh, honestly, I, you know, I should just build a, I, I think I might just build a test portfolio like with fake money that they let you do on, on my trading app. And I'm just gonna pick maybe three or four of the top weighted companies in each one of these ETFs, comprise an entire portfolio of it and just see what the performance kind of looks like. This thing right now yielding 4% monthly, uh, taking a look at the holdings in here before we take a look at any of the dividend growth, we can see first and foremost, the sector allocation is mostly a uh, retail, which as I mentioned, retail is in kind of devastation here to a major extent, depending on the retail you're involved with. You've got real estate services. So that'd probably be like your, I mean, we got some pretty big real estate services here like Remax. Um, I think Remax is probably one of, or not Remax, um, uh, Royal Lee Pages, I think was the only publicly traded one that got bought out by some other company. You got residential. Uh, those are probably good sector. And then you got industrial that I care a little bit more about, but you can see Canadian apartment properties, I think it's probably one of the better reads. First Service Corp. You got Real Can, which I'm still a fan of here. But Canadian Apartment Properties at this point, I would probably put at the tippity top of the list with things like Granite Real Estate Investment Trust and perhaps Dream. Because uh, as mentioned, you really want to focus on the logistics centers. They're one of the only sectors that are seeing explosive leasing rate growth. Like they're, they're doing fairly well in this crazy market environment. But when it comes to growth in this sector as a whole, again, pretty abysmal considering 10 years ago, your dividend would have been around four to seven cents on a monthly. They somehow stabilized that into 2018 and then it fell back down to seven cents. So again, virtually zero. And it, it, like it hurts me inside so much that not only have you given up, like how in the greatest economic real estate growth market pretty much in the world has an ETF that is, you know, pretty much giving you the best exposure to things like Toronto and all these different Canadian markets have pretty much given you zero growth over the last 10 years and zero dividend growth. Whereas I, I just, I can't wrap my head around. You would have almost been better just buying a piece of real estate, paying all the phantom costs just to live in it and then selling it 10 years later. You probably would have seen a higher rate of return than owning this ETF, which again, it just, I don't know what the deal is with it. Management fees, who the heck knows, but it really shows you the convoluted nature of Canada's sector, like these different sectors in these markets, right? It's, it's just crazy to me that that's been the, the state of reality. I mean, if you own real estate, you're still up so substantially at that REIT is just devastated. It doesn't mean there's not going to be a recovery because I still think that's largely because REITs are disconnected from their underlying asset value. And if you do the research, most of those REITs trade largely below their NAV value. But then we got the energy ETF. Now, this one obviously correlated to oil, anything energy related coming out of those pandemic lows exploded up almost 500%. So congrats to anybody that loves oil. I tend to avoid oil <clears throat> just because it's highly cyclical in nature. It's hard finding a few oil stocks that have definitely outperformed. There are some we'll discuss uh, toward the end of this video, but taking a look at this sucker here, let's see what we've got for the Canadian markets in this guy. 
um, because as of only lately has it done exceptionally well with a 12 month trailing yield of about 3.87%. And taking a look at those management fees, which we didn't look for VRE, but it's not even worth it when there's no return, but 0.6%. And we can see the top holdings, no surprise, CNQ, Canadian Natural Resources, Suncor, uh, Synovus, uh, you know, Termaline Oil. I haven't really looked into the Termaline too much. Imperial Oil, Arc Resources, Meg Energy, probably a lot of energy stocks you haven't heard of. Crescent Point. My God, Crescent Point takes me back to the days. Um, but just, yeah, look at these. Because again, heavily weighted in those top three holdings. Canada is like, all these sector weighted ETFs are just over concentrated and they underperform because of the lower weighted holdings. Because most of these just don't do well and a few of them do exceptionally well, like CNQ. Suncor's done all right, more or less trades with oil, right? But taking a look at this one, if you if you zoom out, it's kind of crazy to think that like the, the Geiger on this guy has only been 5% over 10 years. But if you zoom in over the last three years, it's been 42%. And then the last five years, it's waning down to 26%. So this really shows you the cyclical nature, obviously, of um, you know just the energy sector and the dividend growth. It really depends on where oil prices are. I mean, just take a look at the five-year growth on your dividends here. You'd be feeling like you're God, but then you zoom out. In 2008, you were getting 21 cent peak. And today you just cracked that 10 years later after seeing nothing but dividend declines. So energy is an interesting sector, but it's one of the largest components of the Canadian market. Now, we also have probably one of the favorite sectors and probably one of the most resilient sectors on a global scale, which is obviously your financials here, folks. Uh, the financial sector obviously goes beyond the Canadian banks, but the Canadian banks are the most recognized. And this one probably being in next to the technology sector and performance, even in this volatile market, uh, which is quite surprising, but down 21%. So you are feeling some pain here and taking a look uh, obviously, another reason probably not to buy this will be fees, but still the dividend on this guy right now, surprisingly, well, the distribution yield is 4.25%. The 12-month trailing is 3.78. Should be paying more attention to the distribution yield as of today. But nonetheless, uh, taking a look here, that's not the best yield. I mean, 4.25 seems kind of bleak when you're looking at even Royal Bank, I think, paying 4.7. You're losing a huge percentage a percentage of it at a 0.61% management fee. And Royal Bank, uh, Toronto Dominion Bank, and Bank of Montreal, <clears throat> yet again, make up what, almost 45, 50% of the portfolio. You got Bank of Nova Scotia, Brookfield Corp, Canadian Imperial, Manulife. Manulife's interesting for dividends, Sun Life Financial, Intact Financial, and National Bank, making up the vast, vast majority. So again, let's talk about the growth here with your dividends. This one actually a lot lower than I would have thought because most of the banks and these kind of companies have been, well, I think the lower end banks, Bank of Nova Scotia, that yields much higher, that doesn't have the same kind of guy gar, but 6.63% over 10 years is quite a Abysmal. I mean, it's kind of not the best dividend growth rate considering we're going to take a look at some ETFs that have better concentrated stocks that have just crushed this. And for a financial focused ETF, it's kind of heartbreaking. I really thought you'd have seen much, much, much better growth. And if we zoom out on that uh, dividend history here, let's just take a quick peek. I mean, we're talking about a 10 year, 10 years ago. I mean, it's still way better than obviously your, your real estate sector, but from 0.07 to 0.15. So, you know, you're, you're getting that doubling at least. I mean, your dividends are, I guess, what is that? A 6% compound is a doubling, but you'd have to be closer to seven, but either way, hey, at least you're you're stabilizing, you're, you're still up over 10 years and your dividends have doubled. So, hey, financial sector in Canada, much better than how the rest of the market has appeared thus far in this recessionary environment. So comparing that to the broader Canadian ETF, and this kind of just comes into play with me saying, if I just pick the largest holdings in each one of these ETFs and buy them in a portfolio, it'd be neat to see the equal weight performance versus something like the Vanguard Canadian Index, which very similar to VOO, just weights these companies based off their market cap. There's no sector, you know, specific, you know, stocks. They just pick the largest market cap and each sector will have a stock that probably gets pretty big. And that's the stock that gets added depending on where it fits within its market cap range. So taking a look at this one, obviously the performance has been exceptional here. I mean, over 10 years compared to all the other industries, this is up 72%. Taking a look, this one's obviously going to have some of the lowest management fees and a 3.5% starting dividend yield, a 0.05% management fee. So you're not losing you know, 10x the dividend or the the management fee and just value, which is nuts to me. So 0.05, much, much better if you were just willing to give up some some dividends there, like the initial starting yield just to get broader market exposure. But also you're not getting just dividend stocks here because, you know, Royal Bank, TD make up the, the vast majority. Shopify is the third largest company in Canada. You got the railways in here. You got Enbridge, Canadian Natural Resources. So like VOO, all the best companies naturally, kind of like oil and water, just float to the top. 
and it's all just passively managed, which is a system that continues to work on an exceptional level. And taking a look at the dividend standpoint, this is also quite interesting because starting with a 3.5% yield, you're getting a 9% 10 year Geiger off this, um, which is astounding. And over three years, 10.82%. So definitely been performing pretty well. Uh, and considering the dividend history here, if we just zoom out on the chart, let's just see what you would have been getting. So you go back 10 years ago, you're probably looking around 10 cents a quarter today, 37 cents. So you're getting pretty much a tripling of your dividend, you know, just over doubling, tripling, which is pretty incredible, right? Just from a broader index. It shows you the patience that you have to have in the market to see that kind of, you know, initial growth. If you've got 30 years ahead of you, can you imagine what the Canadian markets could do if something like that continued? But then people also want to look at these dividend focused ETFs. And this is where things got most intriguing for me, because this doesn't necessarily hold true in the U.S., as it will in Canada, because there's one ETF on the dividend side that has actually outperformed uh, the likes of uh, the broader market. But taking a look here, XIE is a real popular one that I've looked at a lot. And this one also, I think, has some management issues because not only has over 10 years, there been virtually no capital growth. But as we take a look into the ETF, uncomparable to a lot of those sector, you know, focused ETFs, at least the management fee is a bit lower here. I think what's the management fee like 0.2, which falls in line with something I'd be closer to being comfortable with. And the yield right now is astounding at 5.4, roughly 5.4%. So people might get intrigued by that yield and say, yeah, I want that. And you can see Enbridge is one of the largest weighted CNQ, Toronto Dominion, TELUS, Suncor, you know, TRP. And if we take a look at the sector allocation, 30% energy, 30% financials, 16 utility, you know, 10, 11% communication. Uh, you got some pretty good companies in here. But again, a lot of these companies have seen pretty substantial dividend growth over time. Yet when we go take a look at those dividends themselves on a Geiger level over 10 years, you've only seen about a 2.88% 10 year growth. And this is just something I yet have been able to wrap my head around. Why has there been virtually no dividend growth, even though a lot of these companies are incredible, right? 10 years ago, getting about eight cents, whereas today you'd only be getting 10 or 11 cents. So you probably already have well surpassed this dividend level on your yield on cost if you just put it in the VCE or the Vanguard broader Canadian index. It's just kind of crazy to me that in just a 10 year short period, you would have well surpassed it, right? Just with a slower, smaller starting yield, just giving up an extra 2%. Uh, let alone if dividends reinvested, it'd be neat to see the difference over time where the inflection point is for those. But on the spectrum of by far the only Canadian dividend ETF you would need to buy, which is kind of the title of this thing, like the one dividend stock in Canada that if you need dividend income on a monthly basis, that has just by far got all the benchmarks. It has got to be the Vanguard FTSE Canadian High Dividend Yield ETF, the one that I've stirred the pot about buying and selling in my corporate account that I'm still going to be buying uh, within my uh, tax-free savings account at the end of the year because this thing, I just can't find comparable performance. It's kind of it's kind of like the SCHD of Canada. It, it is truly a stellar ETF on, on a, mut, mut, a multitude of different levels. First and foremost, management fee, again, 0.2% of some of the lowest against all those sector ETFs we looked at. And on top of that, you're getting pretty much a 4.1 or 4.91% dividend yield that's paid monthly. We go just a bit lower here. We'll be at that 5% mark. Keep in mind, you're losing 0.2% to management. So realistically, the dividend is more like 4.6%. But again, incredible starting yield. If we zoom down here, obviously, this one is just focused on these really great Canadian dividend stocks. It kind of discludes the ones that I personally like a lot, um, which are obviously the railways and things like that. But you do get Royal Bank, Toronto Dominion, no surprise, Enbridge, Canadian Natural Resources, Bank of Montreal, Bank of Nova Scotia, Suncor, BCE, TC Energy. This one is highly, highly focused on two sectors that have outperformed in the Canadian markets, uh, whereas the sector allocation here, which is obviously financials and energy, right? So financials make up 54%, highly concentrated, energy at 28%. Telecommunication, I think, could be a little bit more upweighted here. Honestly, what you could potentially do is buy this ETF solely and then just take some of the telecom and utility stocks you like that have outperformed things like Fortis maybe or Hydro One and some of the telecom giants like Bell and Telus and maybe just buy five different stocks and maybe bring the lower weighted sectors up slightly. And it would also probably get you closer to that 5% yield. And you'd still probably see some pretty exceptional performance because from the dividend standpoint, unlike VCE, again, this one's a bit more volatile on the uh, year over year basis, but on a 10 year basis, the, the Geiger has been 13.33%, uh, which has surpassed 
every ETF we basically looked at. On the five year, however, it's a bit lower at about you know 7.5%. So on the, the cyclical last few years, it's been a little bit lower on the long-term scale of things. And honestly, on the short-term scale of things, I think that has to do with the pandemic when most of the banks took a pause on dividend growth. You might remember that year where we didn't see really any dividend increases. So that might be playing into some of that volatility, but still seven to eight percent and on a 10 year 13. I don't think you could ask for much more than that. If I'm being frank about it, if you zoom out on a 10 year here, you go back 10 years, the lowest dividend you would have got was three cents to about seven, seven to three cents. Today, you're getting about 16 to 18 cents, uh, which is a pretty insane increase because, again, you're talking about basically a tripling of the dividend, if not more. So this is by far, you find one more ETF in Canada that's done this kind of performance. Send it my way. I'd love to review it. But in the Canadian economy, this is, seems to be where it all boils down to at the end of the day. When we're talking about individual Canadian stocks, this is where the challenge comes in. Because if you go on most social media platforms, especially like Blossom's blowing up here, you look at Canadian YouTubers and you follow their portfolios, you'll see the same kind of stocks over and over, the same ones that I talk about because people want to hear about them. Your, your usual banks, your telecom giants, but nobody's really talking about those niche kind of stocks. And there's not a lot of them. People just don't talk about them because the yields aren't huge, but the performance, my God, this was one stock that I used to hold back in the day. Uh, if I was smart, I'd have kept it because it's proving to be by far the best stock for this kind of environment, even against the backdrop of inflation and higher cost of goods. And if you've been to the dollar Rama, it's not the dollar Ram anymore. Dollar Rama used to be one to two bucks. Now it's like three to five bucks. Ain't nothing at the dollar Rama <clears throat> much worth a dollar these days. Actually, I think there's cheaper price things, honestly, floating around at Walmart these days. But the dollar Rama still, you know, people just flock there for just cheaper items. And it's blowing my mind that, you know, you take a look since basically at IPO, do you maybe go back 10 year 2013 timeframe? And this thing is up a whopping 833%. This is only comparable to the likes of those US tech companies. Uh, the multiple is pretty insane these days. And it's priced in a lot of the growth here. So you'd have to do some digging into it to see. But I mean, on the revenue basis from the summer, this company is just proving that, you know, people, if they're going to shop for necessities and there's a lot of diversity in those necessities at Dollarama these days, they're going to go that way. I mean, we're seeing it. Same thing with Pepsi I talked about, right? Like Pepsi's struggling on a volume standpoint, but look at Canadian National Railway. So there's two Canadian railway stocks. Talk about these a little bit. They actually trade more favorably right now, in my opinion, than Dollarama does. They've been getting a little bit of pain to some extent, but nonetheless, these are some of the top five largest companies in Canada. And obviously we got Canadian National Railway with a 2.1% dividend yield. It's got some pretty exceptional dividend growth and is up, well, let's see from over the 10 year period, it's up about 200% with the dividend. You tap that into reinvest it and you're falling closely in line with the S&P 500. And then you take a look at this one, which has been by far the greatest growth vector, which I wouldn't say is a pure Canadian company at this point. It's more or less fully globalized. This thing, same with uh, Canadian National. They, these two companies have really spanned well beyond you know, the Canadian borders. This one just closed a massive deal that takes them all the way down to Mexico. And they've had nothing but growth ahead of them. Their yield is about 0.1 or 0.7%. So again, absolutely no dividend here to really discuss. But again, you're, you're just talking about these growth vector kind of companies that you're not going to be getting a huge yield out of, right? But you're taking a look at Waste Connections as well. These are just like the utmost boring stocks. Nobody really wants to discuss them these days. This one also 0.7% yield. You're going back to 2013 and the performance would be up 400%. Again, nobody could have really foreseen this coming by any metric. It's easy to look at this in retrospect, but it's still just astounding when you look at these far and few in between companies that you don't really see weighted in any of these sector ETFs. It's kind of crazy how these don't pop up really anywhere. Again, that might be because I think they're more diversified beyond just the Canadian borders. Like this, this is a technical Canadian company, but I'm taking a look at the U.S. ticker on it here, but still 400% is just crazy. You got National Bank here. National Bank, oddly enough, least talked about bank probably in Canada. People love BNS. They love Canadian Imperial, those massive yields, TD, performance, Royal Bank. But National has been like one of these growth factors in the economy that, you know, from basically 2013 has jumped up roughly 130% with a 4.6% yield today. Not sure what the dividend was back then, but you probably tap that in reinvested compounded growth. I wouldn't be surprised if you're getting closer to that 175, 200% return mark, if not maybe higher. So National Bank probably takes the cake on the best performing bank over the last 10 years. And then obviously in the oil sector, you got your Canadian natural resources. This one over 10 years doesn't really hold up the same because they obviously did a lot with the underlying assets of the company that really expelled this thing over the next 
you know, last what, since the pandemic level, which if you bought the pandemic lows again, congrats, because 650% return is almost jaw dropping. And even with the yield today and the price to earnings multiple oil stays at these levels, this company is doing pretty well for itself. And we're going to finish up with two more in sectors that don't get talked about a lot, but have been in the news recently because of price increases and government control. We got Loblaws. Uh, these we got primarily two major companies that own the monopolies basically on the food sector here in Canada. And Loblaws, you know, this thing has been quite stellar. I mean, obviously, coming out of the 08 financial crisis, it took a long time to recover. But if you pair back that 10 year performance, the stock is up almost 200%, let alone the dividend. And then obviously, a better performer that doesn't really go back as far to the 2008 financial crisis. We do have Metro here as well, which is up a whopping 300%. Uh, and a 1.7% starting dividend yield. So this is like the conversation of choice these days, especially when people head into retirement, is finding that balance between these kind of growth-oriented, you know, dividend stocks, and is it worth sacrificing that kind of future potential to get a higher yield today? Because I know so many people have been just loading up on a lot of these BMO covered call ETFs because BMO. Uh, has basically been running like a rampant promotion and just like obviously paying a crap ton of influencers. Pretty much the biggest Canadian influencers have partnered with, uh, you know, the BMO covered call ETFs. But when you zoom out and just look at the long term performance of those, people are like, ooh, 10 percent yield. Right. But they, they don't even stand up in a market like this. They've done absolutely horrendously against the backdrop of a lot of these Canadian stocks, even like the broader ETFs. Right. So I just wanted to have a fun little discussion today and just kind of take you through what Canada kind of looks like from the best Canadian stocks to what I would consider the best Canadian ETFs to the sector related ETFs. And I'd love to pass that question up to you guys, because I know uh, I'm not sure what a lot of you are up to on this Friday night. I know it kind of jumped the stream a bit early today, but I just wanted to run this quick video for you guys and give you some insights. And uh, when we come back around, uh, I have got some really intriguing stuff coming up uh, for this Halloween season. You know, CAD tech is Shopify and Constellation. Yeah, very true. But stay cool. Stay awesome, folks. And as always, I look forward to catching the next one. Peace.